Welcome to the Demography Today lecture series, sponsored by the BBVA Foundation and organized by the Spanish National Research Council and the Lompoc Horizon 2020 project. And we have the pleasure today to have here Jan Koch, uh, who is a professor of economic and social and demographic history at Radboud University and director of the Radboud Group for Historical Demography and Family History. Also, he is a co-editor in chief of the History of the Family Quarterly. He studied social history at the Free University in Amsterdam and in 1993 joined the International Institute of Social History, one of the main uh, centers in Europe on social history, where he helped uh, to develop the historical sample of the Netherlands, a large database with the reconstructed uh, life courses. Much of his research is based on this database and covers publication on living home and internal migration, on spacing and stopping, on marriage timing and celibacy, etc. Currently, he's exploring the research potential of Dutch colonial population administrations, such as the registers kept on the population of Ceylon, Sri Lanka, and also he's heading a research project that he just uh, started titled Giants of the Modern World, a new his uh, history of height and health in the Netherlands uh, from 19th and 20th century, using detailed information on individuals, their families, and their environments. And uh, this project aimed to answer the question of why the Dutch has become the tallest people in the world, which is probably uh, one of the questions that we will have in the end. So as usual, we have uh, around one hour talk, and then we will open the floor for questions. Okay, so what you see here are two recruits from 1915, one village in the Netherlands, the tallest and the shortest. I'm sure the shortest was not um, enlisted by the time, but maybe the tallest wasn't either. Devote my talk today on these, uh, these topics. Why is a study of uh, heights of interest, not only for uh, health scientists, but also for historians? So what is the rationality behind ethnometric history? And then the question is, why study this in relation with life courses? Why are, what do the life courses add to the knowledge of uh, heights? Um, and then I will talk about my project, Giants of the Modern World, why have the Dutch become the tallest persons uh, in the world. Uh, I will, show, I will um, show some, present some first results of our study. Um, um, they, they will mostly be about early life conditions, especially the effect of household composition on heights. Uh, I also did a little bit of research on catch-up growth and I will end with the later life effects of heights. So does it mean, what does it mean for later life? For instance, marriage, mortality, and reproduction. So why is anthropometric history uh, of any interest? There are different uh, fields in which this, um, this topic adds. Uh, this term, this, term, this, this uh, word, Techno-physio-evolution was uh, coined by uh, Fogel and others. Uh, and there's a whole, actually it's a, it's a world of debates surrounding the nature of the Industrial Revolution and what has been going on in the past 200 years. So the Industrial Revolution, of course, was not just uh, a, 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 the invention of the spinning jenny and the steam engine changing our industrial societies. Of course, we know already that it was a, a large, longer in institutional history of changes surrounding, for instance, property rights, um, uh, supply and demand, uh, demand for consumption goods, supply of labor, geological uh, conditions, where, where to find coal, and so on and so on. But what has not been studied uh, very extensively is the question of bodies, the bodies as engines, as machines. And this is where Flood and his people come in, um, showing that better nutrition made people more able to work. It actually expanded labor force participation and the people who were already in the labor force could uh, uh, actually realize a much larger output just because of the better nutrition. And this, of course, brings us back to the earlier period, 18th century, with agricultural revolution uh, better nutrition uh, uh, provided. So it's, um, it's an evolution. Uh, it is actually humans controlling their environment. 
Uh, it's also something to do with selection, um, generation effects, tall people being maybe more reproductive, children also becoming more tall. So we are having, talking about virtuous cycles here. But then we know also from, also from, the, from the period of uh, Marx and Engels that this early period of the 19th century, the dark satanic mills that you see in the right-hand corner, the, it was a really very bad period. We have been studying um, uh, living conditions in the 1830s and 1840s. It was actually a bad time. So what happened in that time? Why did, in a period when production increased, uh, did, why did wages uh, stagnate? Why did living condition, conditions actually went down, which we can see in mortality and in decreasing stature? So this is what we call the early industrial paradox. And again, this is a whole debate. And then a related question is, of course, what's going on in cities? Why, are, why is living in cities in the early 19th century such a bad thing? And how and why did it change into something good in the end of the 19th century? So what happened in cities? This is, of course, a whole debate on uh, urban sanitation. So this is where the study of uh, stature of height and long-term developments can actually help and be a part and parcel of. Of course, demography is very much about variation. It's not just about national aggregates uh, and long-term trends. It's about differences between groups of people. Now, differences in uh, living conditions, in, in a biological standard of living, just from mortality levels in the 19th century is not always so successful because there was a lot of infections, infectious diseases, which hit the poorest and the richest in similar measure. So maybe we should actually look more at heights to study differences in the biological standard of living more closely. Um, regions, same story. Gender, uh, even more complex actually. Why is there a difference in heights often between men and women? A lot of factors here come into play. This is a very long-term graph uh, created by uh, Jörg Baten and uh, Aravinda Guntapalli. It was actually uh, based on skeletons. Well, this is for the benefit of my daughter, who is an archaeologist. So this is a thousand, two thousand years of skeletal remains, differences between um, um, men and women found in archaeological sites. An interesting thing, thing is that we see periods in which men and women are actually more or less similar and periods in, when, in which men and women diverge. Now, one reason is that men are more susceptible, they're more vulnerable to decreasing levels of nutrition than women, so women are a bit more resilient, that's one thing. But another thing is changes in, in work, production, when women are closely tied to cattle, then they are... Uh, and, and, and dairy production, that probably doing a little bit better. Um, proximity to uh, vulnerability to diseases changes, differences, differs a little bit between men and women, but of course also uh, social position of women can differ. So here we see the uh, period of the, well, this is of course not really, this is based on very small numbers, but Apparently, women in the Renaissance are doing better than women in the period before, still witch hunt. So, it's also interesting, of course, to look at men and women. Uh, another question is, how is the world doing in terms of divergence and convergence patterns? So, there's this whole debate about the great divergence. When did it start? How to measure it? Of course, we should also measure it, this by um, biological standard of living. And then the question is, what kind of patterns do we see? Okay, so here is a world map of heights today. Uh, we see the shortest people uh, living over there in, in Peru, uh, living in Indonesia, for instance. And the tallest people actually clustered in... Uh, uh, Northwestern Europe, but also interestingly in the Balkan and the Baltic region. 
So convergence and divergence, I uh, would like to you to, I invite you to download this book um, called Global Wellbeing Since 1820, when we have tried to um, bring together many indicators on a world global scale, among others on heights. So here we see trends per continent. So East Asia doing pretty bad around 1900, picking up now. We can see that, for instance, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, slow growth and actually decreasing again in heights. Uh, we see Western Europe doing bad in the early industrial paradox, as I told you, 1840s, 1850s, and uh, Western offshoots. So America, New Zealand, Australia, doing the best in the world. What we see basically is no sign of a, a strong convergence in the world. Okay, so this is where the, basically the broad literature, the broad debates in which anthropometric history should be placed. But I'm going to zoom in now to the question of why are life courses actually interesting. So we have now, I've now shown that well-being is often used as an indicator. So uh, height is used as an indicator of well-being. But to really use this properly, we need to understand what's going on. So what are the different processes that uh, can actually explain height at a given age? And then there are many processes that we should look into. So we should look at um, early life conditions. And there are many different factors that affect uh, height already in early life. And I'll talk about this later. We should know how early life affects later life health. So we know from the famous Barker hypothesis that already in utero, so as a fetus, uh, a child can, be, can um, uh, experience changes in uh, genetic expression and metabolism that will affect health in later life. So already things are going on in, in early life that affects later life health. We should be aware of cumulative effects. So even if there is a relative small difference, so you are a little bit shorter, a little bit taller, this may give you an advantage over someone else or a disadvantage, this may accumulate. So because you are shorter, you may not be able to get a good job, you may not be able to get a wife, you may have fewer, fewer children, all these kinds of effects can become larger over time. So cumulative effects, <clears throat> there may be selection effects. People who are taller, stronger, more successful, or deemed more successful, can be discrimination effect as well, may migrate earlier than others, uh, may have more children than others. We should also be aware of, of course, of intergenerational effects. And of course, we have to think of genetic transmission, uh, but also of resources. So here is a little bit of a chart that I made just to uh, show some of the factors going on. So al already nutritional problems can have an effect on life in utero. Um, diseases can affect health in childhood and of course have a cause, uh, an effect on height. Mostly we measure height somewhere around here in adolescence. Children who have to work it costs energy, so everything that is a drain on your energy, so this can be nutrition, disease, work, or trauma, will cause you to, uh, to grow slower than you would have otherwise. But you can have experience catch-up growth. You can actually recuperate from bad effects to some extent. Of course, if the bad conditions last, then you will remain short your whole life. And then the question is, of course, how does this affect your earning capacity, partner choice, family formation, mortality, and your reproductive success, and then the cycle may start all over again. Okay, so to... Um, to reconstruct these 
life course effect. To, to disentangle these life course effects, we need proper data, we need proper material. And this is, of course, always a challenge for historians. Um, <coughs> now, we are in the lucky opportunity that we already 25 years ago started a large project called Historical Sample of the Netherlands, in which we began to reconstruct life courses. With life courses, I mean uh, standardized biographies. So the same kind of information is, is gathered uh, in a similar way, properly documented for a large amount of people. In this case, 80,000 persons, 85,000 actually. A half percent from all the birth certificates from the Netherlands in the 19th and early 20th century. It's a prospective sample, so we do not look back from people who may be old and rich and then we try to reconstruct their lives. No, we start really at the beginning and the person may die within a day or they may live to 100. In that case, of course, it's a costly person for us, but anyhow, we have traced them in their entire life courses. The uh, second stroke of good luck was that in 1850 the Dutch government decided to start population registers. Uh, actually, they copied this idea from the Belgians. Which means that, uh, of course, in every country you have every 10 year a census, but in 1850 they decided to keep the census up to date. So every day something happened, it had to be recorded to the census office and it would be listed, it would be recorded in the books. Okay, so this historical sample of the Netherlands, it works like this. We um, start with a birth certificate. We try to locate the person who is born in the parental home. We, so we find the registers of the parents. Then normally the person, the research person leaves home to become a servant or a soldier whatever, we trace them in special records for, serf for servants or military. Then they tend to marry, they start their own family, and again we find them in the population registers, and finally they die and we uh, enter the death certificate. What kind of information can we find? We have here a, an example of the population register, I, I, I've just took this because it's nicely written, mostly it's much worse than this. So here we see the head of the household is a man called Henry Bromlow. Uh, he was born 1828 in the city of Utrecht. So we have registration date, surname, given name, gender, relation to the head. So we have here a head, his wife, his son, another son, unrelated, so this is probably a border or lodger, a niece, and a daughter-in-law. Uh, we have their dates of birth, places of birth, civil status, and it continues. Uh, religion, this is actually a multi-religion household, three different groups mentioned. We have the occupations, uh, the exact address, and this is, of course, most important for us. When exactly did they arrive here? Where did they come from? When did they leave? Where did they go to? And, of course, by using this information, we can actually reconstruct complete life courses. Actually, the um, number six here, um, this, um, this person here, she was the original sample person. Uh, this was just an episode in her life, just lasting six months because her mother died and she decided to live with her uh, uncle and aunt and then she went back uh, when her father kicked out her stepmother. So this is, um, and then she, she got back home. So just six months, but you can imagine that if you have this kind of information on 40,000 persons, so running into 400,000, maybe a million of this kind of detailed information, that you can start to play around with family and household composition, of course, if you also have information on heights. This is the second part, next part of my story, where to get this information. It's not easy. 
In many countries, um, you only gather heights from, for instance, prisons or um, pass student passports or passports or student listings or slave sales, like in the, in the US, all very special uh, populations. Fortunately, again, thanks to Napoleon, we have a conscription since 1810, which means that everybody uh, who reached age 19 was supposed to be examined. We are still in the business of finding out, because we know who is actually supposed to be examined, who did not show up. And we suspect that boys who were already quite tall and healthy, so unlikely to be discharged, uh, but whose father could pay for a so-called remplacement, so a replacer, they didn't bother to show up. If, if, they were, uh, if the lot was drawn in the lottery, because this was a lottery system, then the father would pay for a replacement anyhow. So we probably see, we don't see enough rich kids. This is still to be examined. Still, this material is scattered around the country in all the archives, so it is very difficult and time-consuming to, uh, to link 40,000 randomly chosen persons to all this archival uh, material. But another stroke of good luck is um, a new phenomenon, I hope it's also in Spain, I'm not sure, called crowdsourcing. We have many projects in which volunteers are uh, helping us, uh, mostly of course for their own reasons, for genealogies, but they are opening up the sources. So a large project was uh, opening up, creating uh, digital indexes on these military records. And this is why it's very, it's become very easy for us to link our life courses to these uh, military records. So still there are, there can be some biases. So we missed the, probably the rich kids, and but I think we also miss a number of poor kids who were already sent into the army, sometimes at age 12, or they were sent to a pauper colony. And sometimes we also find this in the records. Or they were already in prison and prisoners are not in these listings. Okay, this is what you find on these military records. Uh, so of course, name, place and time of birth, place of residence, uh, parents, occupation, and this is of course what interests us here, is the exact height in millimeters, so 1,678, and which we also are now entering, we don't know if it's in, in, of interest at all, is how a person act, actually looked like. This is in case he was a deserter. So an oval face, an ordinary uh, head, uh, gray eyes, a uh, common nose, a small mouth, and a pointed chin. And the last column says, uh, was there a reason not to go into the army? And actually this person, he, uh, his brother had already enlisted, or several of his brothers, and then you were exempted. Okay, so this is what we are now entering for a large group of men. I will talk a little bit about, more about this later. But of course, then we still do not know the living conditions. What's going on? What is the economic situation? Um, again, I'm drawing on someone else's work here. Uh, this is Mr. Knibbe. He calculated the entire harvests uh, and all the imports of foodstuff, uh, deducted all the exports that he could um, reconstruct, calculated caloric value per capita. Then you know the availability of foodstuffs in the Netherlands. And then he charted this against, plotted it against the average of heights that we already knew from military statistics. An interesting thing is that you see, of course, a very close overlap. Maybe there's a, a lagging of one year or so, but, which means that the availability of foodstuff just before boys were measured, so probably at age 17, uh, is actually of pretty much importance. So, so this puts into perspective the idea that this is only early life conditions. So what we now see here is probably boys who do not have the opportunity to uh, experience their catch-up growth. So if they have problems in early life, they were catching up, but these boys, probably at age 17, living in a very, very bad period, were not able. So what's going on here? Of course, here in the 1840s, we have the uh, very bad potato crisis. 
but um, the worst period is actually here. It's the Crimea War, so the war uh, in which uh, already the potato had not recovered, but also could no longer reply on, uh, rely on grain imports because uh, we were used to have our, get our grain from Russia. Uh, so this is actually the worst, the worst period in calorie. So here, here we see the potato crisis, here we see the grain, and then, of course, everything. You see the heights. So more than 30% of the boys were rejected because they were smaller than 1 meter 55 centimeters. So this is really, really short boys. Interesting thing also is that around here the connection gets lost. So we no longer see the effect of uh, caloric availability to average heights. And even this effect of the First World War, uh, in which the Dutch did not take part, but we, we were uh, having problems getting imports, we do not see an effect on heights anymore. So this is part of our study. What, do we, what, do we, what can we find out about this? Finally, we need to have more information on the context. What do, what do, we, what do we know about these places? We would like to know a lot. So medical care. Uh, is it an isolated place or not? What is the food availability, population density, the wealth, uh, of course, the disease environment? Um, so here we have a map of infant mortality in the Netherlands, and you can see at once that there's strong regional difference. So this is a very bad region. Why is this? Because uh, this is below sea level, the water is not flowing nicely to sea, but it's still stagnant, also a bit salinated, perfect place, for instance, for malaria and other kinds of infectious. And if you then do not breastfeed long enough and you get your water for your child from the, from the surface water, then you have a big problem. Interesting thing is here is also below surface, but you women were traditionally breastfeeding much longer. So later on, the pattern would change, and this would be a very bad area, and we still do not exactly know what's going on. So it's important to know in what kind of area children were growing up. Okay, so the project <clears throat> that I just started, that Diego introduced, is called Giants of the Modern World. Why and how have you become so tall? What we will do is we will take 13,000 men from the uh, historical sample of the Netherlands, take information, of course, of course we know already these complete life courses, but we take additional information from the military records. Plus, um, we are going to do our utmost to find uh, data on the second examination. This is also very interesting. We did not know that so many of these records have survived, but many men also were enlisted in the Civic Guards. So, a well, not a volunteer army, but a reserve army. This is very interesting because then we have the two measurements of the same person. Uh, uh, what is also new to our project is that we will also try to find the heights of the fathers, of brothers and sons. So, we have hoped to have three generations, or at least two. In, in this way, we can uh, take account of, uh, of transmission effects. Um, and we know that ab about 80% of variation is actually basically genetic. So it is, it is basically your, the height of your, your father and your mother that determines how tall you will get. Unless these environmental, these, these early life conditions are very bad, then, of course, your likelihood that you will inherit the heights from your parents is much lower. So this is part of our research. How, how, how important is this transmission when we take a long time? It will probably be much less in the early half of the 19th century. Okay, and then we will try to gather community information as well, uh, as I described. So we have three separate projects. So one PhD student is studying um, this early life conditions, uh, socioeconomic conditions of the, of the father, um, environmental conditions, and household allocation. And I will uh, talk much more about household allocation in the second half of my talk. 
Uh, another PhD student will look at the later life effects of heights, controlling for the early life effects. And another project is a postdoc looking at, well, the whole question of social policy, economic changes. Um, how, why, why, why is there a changing variation in the Netherlands from one region to another? Um, how can we explain this? And I will, in the end, in a couple of years, try to wrap it all up in a synthesis. Okay, so here are some basic hypotheses. Why have we actually become so tall? Um, here you see the Dutch are the yellow ones. In the 1850s, we were actually, well, not doing terribly well. We we're actually at the bottom here in this sample of a few countries, same level as France. But then we picked up and by the 1930s, we have surpassed uh, other, most other countries, basically all other countries. Um, now men are still the tallest in the world, women are second only to Latvia. Okay, so the kind of hypothesis we are thinking about, of course it is, it has a lot to do with uh, protein availability uh, and how much is available to the large urban population we have. Please do not forget that we uh, already in the early 19th century had 30, 40 percent of the population already living in a city. And the question is how were they fed and uh, who was controlling their quality of their food, for instance? How were markets integrated? So even if there was a good production, um, how, how fast could it reach these, these urban uh, centers? Um, one of the problems, for instance, was that a lot of the dairy products, so we were actually doing very well in, in dairy products, as you know, but they were actually selling it to the British, to London, and not, uh, so it didn't reach the urban poor um, for a long time in, in, until the 19th, late 19th century. So it's, it's not very good, it's not very interesting to have very good dairy production if you're going to sell it. Taxation, there was direct taxation on foodstuffs and uh, this, was do it. this was of course very bad in terms of uh, purchase power. So this change has changed in the 1860s. Uh, probably a large part of the secular change can be explained like this. Food control, uh, we know that uh, milk was transported to the cities but it was di diluted, you know, there was water added to it. People uh, really got ill from this kind of milk. Uh, so control on the quality of milk, this kind of thing started to improve in the 1880s, 1890s, not before that. So all these kind of changes you have to take into account. Um, economic change, um, real wages, improving, uh, industrialization in the Netherlands started a bit late, but of course we were already a relatively wealthy country, uh, 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 high standard of living, comparable to Eng England. And we should also not forget that even if people were very poor, if they were uh, um, so-called uh, deserving poor, like widows or orphans, you were well taken care of by church charity. Poor relief was in the hand of the churches, not, in, not by the state until well into the 20th century, but the churches were actually competing with one another because we have a diversity of religion they were parading the orphans around in uniforms to show that they were really taking care of the poor. Of course, if you were a single mother or something like that, then you were in serious problems. But, um, child labor, again, very important. If you have a drain on energy by having to work very hard, hard as a child, so laws against child labor, uh, compulsory education from the 1870s, uh, disease control, fertility, um, decline, all may be part of the story we are trying to unravel. <clears throat> okay, but I'm going to focus now a little bit on early life effects. Uh, summing up a little bit, we need to know, we would want to know um, uh, environmental uh, factors like nutrition, disease environment, so this is what we're going to study, but we are also very much interested in 
household effects, socioeconomic status, um, norms on nutrition. So here comes here's where religion come in. We know, for instance, that Jewish people had strict uh, food norms. And it actually make, could make it a, a more expensive for them to really acquire the, the kosher food they needed. Uh, the Catholics in the Netherlands have been accused of, uh, the, the priests have been accused of discouraging breastfeeding. These are, these are uh, consistent rumors um, that um, are supposed to lead to high uh, infant mortality among Catholics. Um, actually, several of my students are working on this. They are now dispelling these notions, but still they are um, strong. So the whole idea was that breastfeeding in public was very uh, immodest and that you should actually try to restrict breastfeeding as much as possible. And indeed, there were some differences in breastfeeding patterns, but probably not as strong as has been suggested. But still, it can affect heights as well. Okay, what I will focus now um, a bit more is the question of how to understand what is going on inside households. And as I told you, I, we have this detailed information of these households. So this is where we can play around with. So households are, um, um, well, these are of course very fascinating constellations, institutions, a lot of things going on that we need to understand. Of course, it's not just um, uh, father earning money and, and, and the children eating. This is in the, we're talking about the 19th century. A lot of people were still engaged in agriculture or working on a workshop in which everybody did some task. And children, especially if they didn't have to go to school, already could contribute to uh, household production. So it was not such a bad thing by definition to have a lot of children. Uh, in fact, we know that uh, uh, farmers, small farmers, they kept on having large families until the 1960s. So this is uh, part and parcel of the household economy. And even if there was no production in the household, there was still a lot of uh, income sharing. So sharing your wage income and pooling it. And then if you are living with a, if you, if you are a small child and you are living with three older brothers who all bring in some money, then maybe it's a, actually a very good thing to have a, a large family. So this is what we need to find out. How is, in the 19th century families we study, how are these things um, um, actually, uh, how, how does the family economy work? And of course, these are hypothetical constructions. You know, we only have these, we only have the place of residence and the occupation. So this is why we have to link our findings to, to the literature or other studies. And then the question is, um, okay, how are resources divided inside a household? Is it just uh, very um, altruistic? Everybody gets a share or is there a fight if the, if the resources are scarce? And who, who gets first, who gets second? Uh, is there gender discrimination going on? So there's a, this resource dilution is of course a famous term from, uh, from family sociology. So basically it says that the fewer resources there are because there are more children, the less everybody gets. And this means that you have, will have lower opportunities for instance for social mobility. But of course, uh, households are also places where people live together and where people get ill together and, and when they bring in diseases from outside, then um, um, this risk is increasing. And unfortunately, we do not know the housing that people had. I mean, are they living in one room? Is it a big place? Are they? So this is also a problem. Households are finally very dynamic. Everything can go on every, on every day. So, for instance, in one day, your par both of your parents can die and then everything changes in your household composition. So we need to be aware of uh, the impact of big family crisis and it can be traumatic and trauma can also be a drain on your energy. And households, of course, are also places of emotional support. Um, we do not know very much about emotions and heights. But there was a very interesting study, findings by a British nutrition expert called, called Elsie Widowson. Um, she was studying food 
uh, nutrition in two German orphanages uh, just after the Second World War. So two small orphanages, basically the same, uh, all, both consisting of 50 children. Uh, both turned out actually to have the same kind of nutrition, but the children differed strongly in heights, in, in growth. So what's going on? And then she discovered that in, in one uh, of these orphanages, a really terrible nurse uh, was feeding the children. And the children were really afraid. So they cramped up and they didn't even get uh, proper food. So they were, and they was called the dragon lady. And the other orphan, orphanage was really a nice, uh, nice woman uh, taking care of the children. So these findings were really very robust. And this is, of course, where she says, so mental, mental contentment, emotions are extremely important also in understanding what is going on in, in families. Okay, so how to understand these household um, resource allocation mechanisms or systems? I would like to point you at a recent special issue in the, in the history of the family with Stefan Oeberg from uh, Gothenburg um, brought together a large number of articles all dealing with the question of understanding the effect of family size and rank order so resource dilution basically on, uh, on heights. So this is uh, an interesting special issue. So family size uh, has often been used, so basically to study this resource dilution. So the more, uh, the fewer there is, the shorter people will become, the more siblings you have. Rank order basically of course says something uh, different. So if you are the first, maybe you get some more, maybe because you are the, to take, supposed to take over the farm or the workshop. Maybe because you are still, you still have the undivided attention of your parents, it's better for you, so you can have some more emotional support. Maybe if you are the last, you can actually benefit from these elder siblings helping you. So maybe there's a problem for the children in the middle, Problem is that both these uh, family size and rank order, they are of course connected to each other. So it's very difficult to study them independently. And this is why Oeberg and others came up with so-called birth order index. And the birth order index is actually very low for first children in a large family. And it's very high for the last children in a, sorry, for first children in a large family, and it's very high for large, last children in such a large family. Um, so we expect actually a curvy linear effect. We expect it to be worse for children in the middle. And this is uh, independent from the family size, so you can use family size and the birth order index. But it can also be interesting to look at the question of whether boys are, um, whether girls are discriminated. So it's interesting to see whether, what happens if you look at share of boys. Other people uh, study the dependency ratios. So the number of people aged 10 to 14 or 65 and over. We propose something relatively new. It has been done in ethnographic studies. But I, so far, but never know, uh, it has not been done that often in um, historical studies. So we propose a consumer-producer ratio in which we can take account of all the household members. So also living in uncles, grand grandparents, uh, whatever you have, nieces, nephews. And finally, we can tweak this. Uh, to account for socioeconomic conditions and what we know about specific families. So what do we know about children working in farming families, children working in um, earning money in, in uh, proletarian urban families? This kind of information we can add to our uh, ratios. So how does it work, this consumer-producer ratio? Um, first, of course, we have... Uh, 
to make adjustments for the calorie need by age and by gender. This is, um, for instance, uh, 2015 dietary guidelines. I show more or less it's the same in the 19th century. Um, and then the question is, how do we deal with production assumptions? Well, we have used a number of budget studies. So in the 1880s, 1890s, um, studies have been made in which people uh, were asked to explain how their money was earned, the household money was earned, and how it was spent. So uh, the earnings of children and other household members were uh, listed in these budget studies. So we studied um, at least 30 of them. Um, and they actually showed some differences between um, urban families and rural families. Uh, these first lines, they come from a study by uh, Hamel called Chayanov Revisited. So Chayanov was a Russian household expert and he actually uh, made this consumer producer ratio and this Hamel, he uh, reworked it a little bit and what we've done is to actually adjusted this to the Dutch situation as far as we know from these budget studies. Um, so these are the different trend lines we have. So we have come up with about eight different assumptions that we can apply to our uh, reconstructed life courses. So here is um, an example. Suppose you are this little boy and you will be measured later on, 10 years later. And suppose we want to know what the effect is of this family situation on later life height. So do you get enough food? Well, we calculate a mother's consumption, mother's production, this sister and another sister. So she is eating a little bit, but she is producing nothing, of course. Here we have father, and of course we can have thousands of other kind of household situations. Okay, in this case, the consumer producer ratio is 1600, or 1.6. And the question is, um, of course, the higher the ratio is, do we find an effect on later life height? Does the boy, will the boy have an effect later on from the fact that he grew up in this more or less tight situation? So we have calculated these uh, consumer ratios for every year of a boy's life, and it turned out that uh, the situation at age 17 had the strongest effect. So again, we have um, the idea still that adolescence is actually, uh, in this situation, more important than the early life effects. Anyhow, this is how it worked. Here we have again our hypothesis. So nutritional status is of course, the net effect of all the energy that you have in your life, uh, which is then going to, into height. So, the, bet the fewer diseases you've had and the better health care um, leads to uh, greater, taller heights, and um, the better, more food you've had, better food, and the less you've worked. Okay, so household size or sip chip size. Still, we have the assumption that household size uh, has an effect on crowding, so there may be diseases here. We have to be aware. So we assume that in, in larger households, there will be more infectious diseases. But of course, there's also an effect from household size on nutrition. And then we have the birth order index. As I explained, probably children in the middle were doing better. And then we have our consumer-producer ratio affecting, again, nutrition and work. And there's the question whether there's maybe also a competition between boys and girls, or especially between brothers. So these are the hypotheses that we, are, we were testing. But of course, it's no use if you do not control for many things, like, as I said, socioeconomic status, religion, of course, trauma, traumatic situation, like uh, the father and the mother, uh, have they deceased? Literacy is always often used in this kind of studies because um, literacy also 
shows something about a person's openness for medical advice, how to take care of children, and so on. Is it an urban or a rural place? Birth cohorts affects <coughs> food availability. And as boys were still growing, we also included the month of birth. So the first data collection, um, as I told you in the beginning, we will have 13,000 complete uh, life courses with heights. This is, we now have about 6,000. Um, and for 2,000 of them, we actually have this household data. So on the basis of the 6,000, we can all already, of course, um, look for the trends, but we are talking about 6,000 here only from these provinces, so we still lack the eastern part of the country, but we're working on this. Uh, it will be a matter of time, and here we have just a distribution. Okay, here are some, some preliminary results. I look here only at the controls. Of course, social class is, as always, in, uh, very important. Middle class is the reference category. Unskilled workers, farm workers, but also skilled workers are doing much worse significantly. Catholics were doing basically uh, okay, it's uh, no difference, but Jewish people uh, were much shorter than uh, the Protestant Dutch. This may still be a lingering effect of the discrimination, uh, which was legal until 1800. Uh, it may also be an effect of poverty that we do not capture here. It may also be an effect, again, of this uh, expensive food because of their uh, the cash roots, um, food prescriptions, their food was more expensive. Uh, when father could not write, again, this is uh, very negative on height, so this is a difference of uh, one and a half centimeter. Uh, when the mother had died, this was very bad for a child, uh, as we can expect. The difference, there's actually no difference of the father having died. Again, this has, this has actually been found in other research as well, and we expect here the Dutch poor relief kicking in. For people in poor conditions, it was actually better to have no father than a father, so because of the poor relief, we, we think. Uh, month of births going on. This is, of course, a bit strange that the calories do not have an effect, but then we do control for all the birth cohorts, so probably much of the calorie availability is already captured by birth cohorts here. And there are some regional effects. Okay. This is a bit complex. Actually, these are 13 different models. Uh, we leave out all the controls and we only look at the effects of the different household allocation indicators that I described. So, Consumer-producer ratio based on household activities, added with one on wages, household size, sip ship size, birth order index, the only child effect, and the percentage of boys. Now, what we do find is that the consumer-producer ratios are having much stronger effects than the previously traditional indicators that you find in the literature, such as uh, uh, family size and birth order index. Actually, the birth order index is not doing anything. So we concluded here that the um, uh, consumer producer ratio is indeed an interesting innovation. Of course, we still need to find more of these budget studies to improve our material. Even when we use this, we still find an effect of only child, of course. So if you are living as an only child, then it's actually good. Um, you get all the attention. And even if we use this, so we control actually for different needs of boys and girls in terms of calorie, still we find a negative effect of growing up with boys. So controlling for the differences in caloric needs, still an effect of growing up with boys, might point in a direction that if a boy is growing up with only, only sisters, then he still gets a little bit more than he, did, than he needs, his body needs. So this could be an indication of um, some kind of discrimination also going on. Okay, so this is the summary 
what I just said. We do find that these effects of household resources, scarce resources, people may be fighting a little bit about, becomes a little bit weaker. And this may actually point at the same period here, the, 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 the connection between, between food availability and heights becomes disconnected, becomes weaker. Probably the Dutch have reached a threshold in which actually most of the families are in, beyond the danger zone, basically having enough for their, for their basic needs and uh, do not have to fight each other for uh, the last helping of food. Okay, and we also found this uh, controlling for all this. We still find an effect in large families, so probably also overcrowding infections are still playing a role. Okay, so this is, um, I still have a few minutes, I think. Actually, I have many more slides, but I'll try to be uh, a little bit brief. Um, this is just age 19, but the problem, as I, uh, I told you, is boys are still, st are still growing. So I did a research in a smaller, small, um, small township, industrial city, uh, proto-industrial city of Wooden, South Holland. Actually, quite a large number. So we have 1,200 boys measured at age 19, also 1,600 boys at age 25, and, and about five or 600 of them measured at both ages. And then we find that there's a serious catch-up growth, and on average, almost five centimeters, which is quite a lot. So in the literature, it was actually thought this would be about two centimeters. Uh, in the 19th century, it turns out to be, at least in the first half of the 19th century, almost 5%. A, a staggering two and a half centimeters of boys rejected because they were too short. They would still continue growing after age 19, another 12 and a half centimeters. Then the question is, of course, do we still detect these early life conditions when we know these boys at age 25? And then we find that we find many more effects at age 19, for instance, illegitimacy, literacy, um, age of the mother, the uh, influence of epidemics, but it's all gone when we do the same analysis at age 25. Then we only find child labor, Jewishness, and some socioeconomic effects. So this is, the conclusion is, age 19 is ideal to study early life conditions, but it does not say that much about the uh, later life stature. Still a lot of catch-up growth is possible. Okay, um, I will have to uh, be brief in the remaining part of my talk, uh, which was about the later life effects. Um, because in our project, Giants of the Modern World, early life, as I told you, is just uh, one part of the whole project. We also want to study uh, impact on mortality, marriage, and reproduction. So I will be... Um, very brief here, most of the studies, they do show a connection between height and mortality, partly because bad conditions are still there. But even if you control for um, early life conditions, height does have some effect. Um, short men may have some more um, uh, heart diseases, cardiovascular diseases. But on the other hand, tall men do have a higher risk of cancer. So it's, re it's really not very easy because there are differences in causes of death depending on the height. Um, this is a so-called Waller curve. The Norwegian scientist Waller has done a great study. Hundreds of thousands of persons uh, aged 50 to 64, they were followed for 20 years and they, they were measured at age, so at age 50 or 60, or in their 50s, and weighted as well. And then we see, of course, that we see weight here, we see height here in reverse order, so the shortest men are at the back, and we see mortality risks in these 18 years of the study here. And then, of course, we see nicely that, on average, being shorter is 
uh, leads to increased mortality risks. But of course, it depends also on your body weight, so your, so your, 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 your weight, so your body mass index. So if you are very, if you are very tall, uh, but also very heavy, it's not so good. But if you are short, but also um, uh, very skinny, if you're tall, but also very skinny, it's also not very good. So you need to have an ideal body mass index. So we've seen just the, uh, the boys who were growing rapidly. It's also not so very healthy. So many studies show this. We're also going to, to try to find this in our research as well. So these 12 centimeter catch up growth may actually not so, be, not so be very healthy in the long run because these uh, boys tend to have also uh, other problems with their health. <clears throat> Okay, other studies uh, that we know of look at the effects of um, height on education, for instance. It's not so, uh, not so very easy because um, the, th the factors, uh, the energy that goes into your, uh, the growth of your bones also go to your brain. So it, it is these, these problems are correlated. So uh, there may be... A, a positive correlation between height and uh, intellectual capacity, which makes, of course, uh, difficult to entangle these effects. And, of course, we do not know um, IQ of our sample persons in the past. Uh, a recent German study uh, actually showed that uh, even controlling for intellectual capacities, tall school children in Germany were actually getting better results. And this is probably because of, uh, of other qualities that they have just than intellectual qualities. And again here, some kind of discrimination appears to be, some favoring by the teachers seems to be the case. They actually have higher likelihood to be promoted to gymnasiums than, uh, than shorter boys. And it doesn't work for the girls, so it's a strange uh, mechanism going on here. What we do know that uh, tall men all, all over the world earn more money. Uh, especially if they're doing manual work. This may be the reason why they are often preferred. So if you, if you call for uh, partner preferences, many uh, women would prefer um, a man that's slightly taller and men, uh, women who's slightly shorter. Of course, this is a bit extreme. Um, and this is confirmed in many studies, not only on preferences, but on marriages themselves, so a sort of different mating. On reproduction, um, I found two uh, important studies. This is um, a great overview by Rebecca Sears. She's doing really always wonderful macro studies, uh, I mean um, meta studies, which brings together all the, all the literature on a specific topic. Um, but on, uh, on, on reproduction, she basically found all kinds of effects. There is no clear universal relationship between height and um, reproduction. So the number of children that you get. In some areas, there is a, a positive relation. Sometimes it's negative. Sometimes it's uh, an inverse U-shape. In, um, in, in this meta study, she basically couldn't come up with a explanation. Uh, but I also found a Dutch study that we hope to replicate in our own work. So this is a recent Dutch study, a large um, panel study uh, covering this from the 70s until the present. Um, uh, several hundred thousands of persons in the north of the Netherlands. And what they um, discovered so these lines here are actually the number of children in your present, um, uh, present relation. So these are men, these are women. So clearly there's a connection. But what they did here was uh, look at the entire reproductive history, um, so earlier uh, relationships as well. And then we see that still there is, of course, a positive connection, but it levels off for very tall men here right, and very tall women as well. And this, um, this is a likelihood to be in a relationship. And this is the start of your 
relationships. So basically it comes down to tall men starting a little bit later, but being more likely to have a marriage or to be in a partnership and actually to have more surviving children. So what these, um, these uh, researchers, so especially Gert Stulp, um, concluded was in the Netherlands, especially tall men, but also tall women, uh, they have more children, um, which could be, could lead to this selection cycle of passing it on to the next generation, part of the secular growth, still continuing more or less, not so strong as in the past, but still continuing in the Netherlands. Interesting thing is uh, they did the same study in the US and they did not find it. They find something more the reverse. In the Netherlands, in the US, shortest women had uh, higher reproductive success and they tended to mate with men of average stature. So in the Nether in US there could be a cycle the other way around with um, transmission of more or less shorter stature to the next generation in the Netherlands, uh, they find something different. So our question of course will be, uh, do we find this also in 19th century uh, non-birth controlling situation, um, completely different mortality levels? Is it part and parcel of uh, why we have become the giants of the modern world? And that's where I want to conclude my talk here. Thank you.